Uh, oh, okay. Oh, so uh, the, the branding we're supposed to do, uh, I have a website, brandtarbox.org. I've got a bunch of patents. You can either think that's great or think that's terrible. I'll say my patents are actually nice patents. Um, they're not horrible patents. Um, I won a Duke Choice Award uh, uh, in 2010 for a system that turned log files into music so you could listen to your log files, which is kind of cool. Um, I play didgeridoo, but I won't, um, I won't inflict that upon you. Um, did, did either sounds like this wonderful native music or um, elephants passing gas. So I won't inflict that on you. Um, and on the side, I write uh, uh, Alexa, Alexa skills. So if you have Alexa devices, go home and ask Alexa to open Premier League. You'll be boosting my stats. I'll really appreciate that. Um, and so, uh, so contacts and caveats. So I work at a company called uh, Kajito. And uh, we make software that listens on, um, on call center calls. And um, we detect the emotional content of the call. Um, and we analyze things like turn taking, speaking energy, emotional content of the call, and give information back to the call center uh, rep so that they can do a better job uh, supporting the person who's calling in. And so the reps love it because uh, they give better service. The, the customers love it because they get better service. Um, it's all good. Now we just have to scale the thing. Um, <laughs> um, we have, uh, uh, oh, and we're hiring. We're hiring for all kinds of things. Uh, uh, developers, DevOps, um, managers, all kinds of roles that I never knew existed. Data scientists, behavior scientists, annotators. Who knows what a data annotator is? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we have um, a boatload of legacy um, uh, CloudFormation uh, code. So I'm giving you a talk about CloudFormation. That's not to say that I think CloudFormation is the greatest thing um, out there. But if you've got um, tons and tons of CloudFormation and you're using it, I'm going to hopefully give you some tips and tricks that you can use to make it better. If you have the opportunity, huh, Terraform. Uh, You've probably heard Terraform mentioned a few times uh, uh, today. It, it's something, it's something to, uh, to really consider. And along the way, I'll, I'll hopefully give you some, some pointers back and forth of things that CloudFormation and Terraform do differently. Um, so we're going to start with, uh, with an overview. And we're basically going to start um, you know, sort of from ground zero, but then we'll pretty quickly get running to sort of the advanced stuff. So uh, I know there's probably a mixed audience but just from listening to uh, the conversations earlier today. And hopefully, we've already sort of got on board with the notion that infrastructure as code is good, manually deploying things in SSH bad. OK, so your choices then are, are uh, you know, things like CloudFormation um, or Terraform. Um, people talk about Pup Puppet and Chef and Ansible and Salt. Salt never gets any love. I used to use Salt, that, but they seem to have forgotten it. That's a whole different thing. That's, as the uh, two talks ago person mentioned, as for provisioning instances as opposed to provisioning infrastructure. So with CloudFormation, we're basically provisioning the infrastructure that then lets your code run on top of that. Um, uh, you, can write, you can write CloudFormation in YAML or JSON. Um, uh, our company made the interesting strategic decision to do it um, all in YAML. So the examples I'm going to show you are redacted, but you know there are examples, so they're in YAML, but oh my god, um, do JSON. Um, uh, so, um, and so just to get us on a starting point before we sort of dive into the advanced stuff. So in CloudFormation, um, a stack is a bunch of resources created by a template. And a template is, or a resource is the actual, or resources are, are the actual things you put out there. EC2 instances, uh, roles, um, uh, databases, and so on. So those are the resources that you put together um, as a, into a stack that's defined by a template. And template, OK. Uh, and templates are source code, so they've got to be version. They should be in Git. Or I suppose people use other things, but I just think Git. Just put them in Git. Be done with it. Um, a, a trick then is. Uh, CloudFormation, or 
Terraform can deploy from Git. CloudFormation has to deploy from S3. So there has to be then the step, you, you source control them in, in Git or version control of your, of your choosing, and then you have to deploy them, you have to copy them uh, to S3 and manage that and version that and all that, but hopefully you're doing all that anyway, and then you deploy them from S3. Um, and this is an example of, of, of a minimal uh, template. Um, it's one resource, uh, probably the simplest one you can make, an SNS topic. Um, you have the boilerplate, you say I want to have resources, you, get, you, uh, you define, did not position the chair well, uh, de define the name of the topic, the, the name of the resource, what it is, and then the various properties. So that's the simplest, that's a, but that's a fully fledged cloud formation template. Going a little, uh, uh, you know, a little larger. This is two cloud formation templates, um, and you know, it's it's basically as simple as that. For each resource, you have you have the block. Each block looks looks different, has its own set of properties, and so on. And then you just have as many of those as you want. There's some absurd limit, like this file can't be more than 55,000 lines. <sighs> okay, um, shame on you if you're doing that. Um, I, I kind of wish I could make the limit be smaller, like maybe a, you know a thousand lines or something. But you can you can get kind of silly. Um, this is a partial list of the resources that that CloudFormation can deploy. Honest to God, this is a partial list. Um, um, I sort of didn't realize, but but the ones in, that aren't in blue are the ones that either we've used or that I've asked, that I've looked for more documentation on. Um, so we use a bunch, but, uh, you know, we have 30,000 lines of, of CloudFormation template file. Oh my God, 30,000 lines. And we've only scratched the surface. So you can do just about, just about anything here. Um, so uh, every resource is distinct, just as every Amazon service is distinct. If you know everything there is to know about uh, EC2, that doesn't mean you know anything about SQS and vice versa. Uh, there's some commonalities and there's services they use, but every one of them has different properties and you sort of have to learn the properties um, for each one. Um, this is sort of subtle, but the documentation is really good at, this is what we do. The documentation is less good at how they interact and what the implications of those things are. Um, and there's not a good way to get that except to make mistakes um, and have pain um, and, and uh, uh, get a service contract. Service contracts, enterprise level service contractors with Amazon are uh, expensive. I think it's like enterprise level you pay 15% uh, of your total bill. But oh my God, it's worth it. If you're doing uh, if, if, you're, if you're deploying this stuff for real, you want enterprise support. Um, but this, this, is, this is a pain point, and there's no, way to get, there's no way to get the experience except to have the experience, unfortunately. Um, so I was trying to show you here that these are examples of resources, and look how different they are. Um, so this is an Amazon MQ broker, one of the newer things that they just added, um, which is actually pretty cool and then an auto-scaling launch configuration. Um, and they're vastly different. And um, you know, most of us who have been doing EC2 stuff forever, it's like, oh yeah, launch configuration. That's cool, that's fine. Um, brokers, how interesting. And I love the fact that this is not my misspelling, this is their misspelling throughout their doc, but at least they're, they're, at least they're consistent. Um, so everyone is very different. Um, Okay, so now we start getting beyond just sort of, you know, 101 stuff. So, uh, parameters. Uh, in some of the earlier talks we've talked about, you wanna be able to deploy things in, each, in, in very different uh, uh, deployment configurations. Uh, you know, dev, uh, st uh, staging, prod, um, and so on. You may have different customers. The way you achieve that with the same set of, of code is with parameters, and so you have you have types of param you have parameters, you have descriptions, and then you refer to them down in the actual uses of the resources. Um, and 
uh, here's a place where I'll draw a distinction between CloudFormation um, and Terraform. So in, in CloudFormation, um, you say, I want to do a substitute you know, of, of uh, this into this string. And this is going to be one of the uh, parameters that you passed up here. Terraform makes it a bit simpler and says, and, and I, I sort of anthropomorphize what Terraform is doing because it's just code and I know it doesn't think. But the, I think if Terraform is saying, with Terraform, you, you don't have to put um, the function here. And I, th I, I, I think of Terraform as saying, huh, you said dollar open brace, something close brace. What should I do with that? Well, you probably meant me to substitute it or find something to do with it. And it just does it for you. And you, you don't have to put, you don't have to have the, the syntactic sugar, the, the, the um, uh, what do we call it in language, language design? The, 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 you don't have to have the ceremony. You don't have to have the ceremony of saying, yes, I want you to do a substitution. Okay. Um, and then you can also, well, well, we'll get to that in a bit. Okay. Um, there's more stuff you can do with parameters, and, and you should. Um, you can say, you can give it a set of, of um, of allowed values, you can give it default values. Um, particularly when you're spinning up um, EC2 instances, there's a previous talk that said, uh, due to, to security, make sure you don't let people spin up the I232X large, whatever the heck it is, the one with you know, a, a thousand cores, and, and this is one of the ways you do that, it's protection. You know, um, my users of this, uh, uh, whatever I'm spinning up, you know, they can make a modest size instance, but they can't make anything too terribly bad. So it limits, it limits your attack vector. Okay. Um, and default values are interesting. Uh, they're very helpful. Uh, we'll get more into Booleans, which are uh, more of a nightmare than you would possibly imagine that they are in CloudFormation. I, I hear some people who have gone through that nightmare. <laughs> um, so one of the tricks is not everything can be a parameter. Um, in fact, the things that can be parameters are actually shockingly limited. Um, you can have strings and numbers and lists, and then we have a few specific uh, resource things that you can put in. So if you've defined a subnet ID, you can pass a subnet ID to a substack, and we'll get into that, or into a regular stack, and it will verify that it actually is a subnet ID. So you've got, you've got data protection. It's like, like you don't want to pass everything as a string to a function because then you can pass anything to the function and you have to defend against it and so on. Um, of all the, th the th resource types that Amazon supports, they give you this list of six or seven things, types that are allowed. And I think that's, I think that's terrible. I love Amazon, I've drunk the Kool-Aid, and, so and I've been a solutions architect for six years or so. Um, so I get to call them when they make a mistake, I think. And, and this, is, this is appalling. Um, and so string, strings and, and so on. Um, uh, so uh, keep this when, in mind when you're designing your stacks that there are things you cannot pass as, as parameters. And uh, just put the link here for the limits of things you can pass. There's also something like you can't pass more than 200 parameters to a stack. But again, if you're passing 200 parameters to a stack, I want to see the sort of C or C++ or Java code you're writing, because actually I don't. Um, <laughs> um, so nested stacks. Um, one of the real uh, 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 powers of CloudFormation is you want to be able to do uh, modularization. You want to have reuse. And how do you do just as all the same uh, characteristics, characteristics we have with regular code, we want to bring to our infrastructure code, because infrastructure is just code. I think we've heard this a number of times. So um, a stack is just another resource that you can put in a stack. And that's often used, and we use it at Kajito for our components. So we'll have reusable things, th things that we use all the time, uh, auto-scaling groups, roles, VPCs, and so on. And then we'll use those as building blocks um, to other pieces. Um, and you can pass parameters and so on um, to those. One of the things you'll notice is that um, when you're specifying a stack, you specify a template URL, and that has to be S3. And just as, as we said before, this is just another example of a place where you have to use S3. So you end up using 
with CloudFormation, you end up using S3 sort of like your artifactory. So you do a build, but then when you deploy, you're deploying from S3, and you can either decide that's a good thing or maybe maybe a tricky thing. And um, I've I've elided the middle bit here, uh, but that's where you'd put um, you'd put version information because uh, since this is code and code is versioned and you're evolving your stuff, you need to figure out a way. Okay, I want to spin up this uh, the cloud real time broker. I want to spin up. I want to spin up this Amazon MQ broker. But what version of that? So I have to specify that, and that's something you need to um, have some some real consideration of. There's there's basically two schools of thought of how you do that. You can you can put one of these dollar brace version strings in here, and have it um, and have it substituted um, uh, through part of, through part of your build, or you can you can specify a parameter. Uh, I think the parameter approach is better, and I'll explain in a little bit later um, why when we get to updates. But you do have to worry about versioning. Okay. Um, this is just the, the, the console. I, th I think the console uh, is uh, an example of uh, a great example of a UI from 10 years ago. Um, you, can, you can see here we have, we've got um, uh, stacks and nested stacks. There's no way just to look at the nested stacks. There's no way just to look at the top level stacks. Uh, the filtering is fairly terrible. Um, that. This is my favorite horrible UI, I think, of all time. And, and I've been doing this long enough that, that you, you, you really have to, sorry, you really have to suck hard to, to make that top list. Um, so, um, but, but, but they've, but, you know, kudos, they've, they've done it. So, those are buttons. Those are buttons that don't change. Yes, that's the right, that is the right, okay, that's the right attitude. So <laughs> these are buttons. They're stateful buttons. You would never know that they're buttons and you'd never know that they're stateful. So you, you've created a template in here. You click the checkbox to validate. And what happens is right in here, it says the template is valid for about two seconds, and then it goes away. <laughs> at that point, and only at that point, is that button enabled. Um, you can press it. I mean, it doesn't visually change. I mean, why would it visually change so that you can know that it's enabled? But anyway, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. It's, um, come on. Um, and uh, you don't have to use the GUI, you can use the CLI. You probably should be using the CLI. It should all be driven by Jenkins or something. But if you're playing with it, um, uh, you should, you'll run into this. And actually, here's, I want to go off script a little bit based on something that I heard in one of the earlier talks. The person was talking about um, automate everything um, and don't do anything manually. And, and I, I, I want to pick just a, a little bit of, of a bone with that. I think I've seen people try to automate immediately. And I've heard the, the saying used to be, anything you do twice, automate. But if you're, if you're just doing something once, don't bother to automate. And what I've, what I've found with, cloud, with CloudFormation and this whole infrastructure as, as code uh, environment is, if you try to do your first um, explorations directly in the, in the orchestration tool, it can be harder than it has to be. The very first time you're spinning something brand new up, and you don't know what you're doing, you're exploring. That's, I think, an okay time to be using the Amazon console and spinning up instances and RDSs and topics and all that. And then you get some thin, bare bones skeleton of, oh, I get it. I want to go this way. At that point, start worrying about automation. But, but you'll save yourself, a, I think, a world of hurt, and you'll go faster if you're willing to be manual just a little bit, not too much. And maybe anyone, nobody else seems to want to say that because we're so, we're so trying to get people away from manual that we don't want to say manual at all, but do a little bit of manual. Um, okay, sorry, I go off script there. Um, so uh, stacks have life cycles, they can be creating, they can be created. Um, 
you know, updates. Updates are interesting. Um, delete is delete is good. We all have costs. Um, uh, we didn't discover that we had a million stacks running that we didn't know about. <laughs> I'm sure you wouldn't. Um, no one would do that. Um, uh, an interesting thing with with stacks is you can have confirmation stacks that you run, they do a job, and they're done, and they tear down. And that's one whole category of stacks. But your infrastructure stacks, you spin them up. You spin up the infrastructure, um, and you leave the infrastructure there. I mean, we've had people come in and say, oh, I spun up the infrastructure. It's all great. I'm done. And they you know, click destroy. It's like, well, thank you. You just tore down the infrastructure. Um, <laughs> So you, want it, you, you tend to have um, the stacks long live, which means you end up having to update them a lot. Um, they can be updated in place with caveats, and we'll get to that in a little bit, and the caveats can be very important. Um, and you'll never see creator update failed, um, uh, except always. Um, uh, and when things uh, fail, CloudFormation actually does a pretty decent job of trying to roll back. One of the tricks that can happen is you're spinning up a nested stack, so you've got a top-level stack and eight levels, you know, eight, eight <coughs> nested stacks underneath it, and the last one fails, and CloudFormation says, I have to roll back. <laughs> wait, 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 don't roll it all back. It's just the last one. Um, and you can control that, but out of the box, it will tear everything down. And that can be, that can be a pain you need to do some advanced work, and I'll show you that in a second. I'm making a lot of promises. I'm, gonna, um, <laughs> I'm keeping an eye on the time. <laughs> um, but the slides will be available. Um, and I wrote the slides in, in the uh, thought that I might mess up the time, um, but I'll try not to. Um, so uh, functions are where we really dive in, into, uh, into the power of the system. Um, and you really, it's worth, it's worth learning about the functions. Go through the examples, um, play, play with them. But this is um, both the power and, we, and also where you see that it's, it, it's clunky is a word that sometimes leaps to mind. Um, so you can, um, you, you can draw and select, split. You can, push, you can push your parameters together and push other resource names together to form the resources that you need to create later on. Um, and then you can do conditionals, but this is I'll give you an example. This is much harder than it, than it should be. Um, and the, but, but you do want to learn about that. Um, so um, ref, ref versus sub. So, so let's look at sub. So here, I'm just constructing, I'm just constructing a name. Okay? And so I'm just doing you know, basically a string substitution. You can think of this as said. Okay? Um, and, ah, and then uh, ref is essentially saying, go grab the resource referred to by this ref. Um, and sometimes the ref is the body of the resource, and sometimes it's the ARN, the Amazon resource, resource name um, of the resource. Um, but it's context dependent and it's resource dependent. And just know that, that you know, in, ge in general, ref will get you what you want, except when it doesn't. Um, and and this, is this is just string substitution. Um, so, okay. Oop, whoop, wrong way, sorry. Um, and then you can, you can combine them um, uh, with, with join. So here, um, I'm trying to write um, a, uh, a parameter store. And of course, since this is Amazon, parameter store is spelled SSM. Um, that doesn't get anything? OK. <laughs> OK. I mean, I know, it, I know it's just system something manager, and parameter store is just one of the pieces. But most people use, who use SSM are mostly using parameter store. OK, I'll let it go. I'll just move on. Um, and so we're trying, to, we're trying to store the endpoint for a broker that we just created. OK? And so we're using, we're using join, and we're saying, okay, you know, the, the, the thing that we're joining on is, you know, an empty string. It's not a comma or something. You know, build up, take each of these pieces, put them together, and that's the value that we're going to store as the endpoint. 
Now we do, there's a tricky thing here, and this is on, on either really cool or sort of horrible, but it's um, the, the, the so, so remember when I said that ref sort of does the right thing? Well, so look at this, I'm building a URL and I've got a ref and, and this certainly can't be the body of the broker and it couldn't possibly be the ARN of the broker except for the fact that um, Amazon doesn't give you a way to access the endpoint of a broker any other way. So what they agreed, and, but they said they, they didn't really agree, but the reference for the broker happens to, the ARN of the broker happens to be the middle guts of the URL for the endpoint. And we discovered this by accident and we, we made this work and we asked our Amazon support people and they said, you can get away with that. So, and we said, is there a better way? And they said, no, there isn't. So, it's, there's, these are the pain points. Um, but, but it does, you know, let you join. Now, to me, this is a, this is a lot of lines of code to, to come up with an endpoint. I'd much rather be able to just say, you know, get at her, you know, broker dot endpoint. And over time, they will, they will do that. One of the things you'll see is that, um, Confirmation does a really good job at keeping up with all the services. I mean, you think that we have a hard job. You know, you know every week it seems Amazon is making a new service. Well, we just have to learn about it and say, uh, you know, machine learning, I don't have to, I don't have to learn about that. Um, or, you know, a new game system, oh, I don't have to do that unless you're a gamer or a machine learning person. Confirmation has to support everything, and they want to support everything day one. And they do a pretty decent job of it, but there are times when there are rough edges. Um, Conditions, okay. This is the code you have to do to do a Boolean, um, which is, <laughs> let's step back. <laughs> um, so I've, I've got this parameter that says whether my broker is, publi is publicly access accessible or not. And so I have my allowed values, true or false. And I say, by default, it's false, because, you know, least privilege. So then I create a condition called is public, and I say, is it equal? Is there a string? Is its string equal? And that gives me a condition. And then down here when I'm creating the broker, I use that, um, I set the property of the broker to this you know, tertiary of is public, true or false without the quotes. Oh, you couldn't just give us a Boolean parameter? <laughs> so, um, I mean, it's great that there is a way to do it, because it didn't used to be. It's great that there is a way to do it, but it's, it's, a, it's a kind of horrible way to do it. Um, so, anyway. Um, oh, oh, this, this one's actually kind of cool. Um, so, um, one of the things that's, that's tricky with, with, uh, with infrastructure as code and everything is declarative is how do you deal with different, different cases? So how do you deal with, the, with um, this broker might have two users that I need to provision, this broker might need to have three users. How do you deal with, with that sort of thing in a, conditional, in, in a, de in a simply declarative language? And, and it, it's, it's fairly tricky and I think, I think neither Neither CloudFormation nor Terraform does a great job of this. I think this is a place where come back in a year and they'll both have better answers. But what we do is, um, so this is, this is the set of users. This is a snippet inside a declaration of, uh, of an MQ broker. And we say, who are our users? Well, um, you know, we're going to have you know, user one that has you know, broker password one, and that's great. Then we've set up we'll have set up a condition of, do we have a second user? And we'll do that by having, in a parameter, we'll have a second user with a default value of you know, no user, and you'll do a condition that says, does it equal no user, or something silly like that. And then you say, if, if it's true that I has a, I, that should be, has, have. Well, if I, 
if I has a, if I can has a cheeseburger, um, if, if, I has, if I has a second user, um, so this is the condition, this is the true case, and this is the false case. So if I do have a second user, these are, these are, the, this, these are the parameters for the second user. If I don't, I have to say something. So there's this really cool AWS no value, which is like none or void. And so this basically says, you know, you know, join this in a list, and this element doesn't exist. But it's syntactically, it's, it satisfies the syntax. So, so you can do this sort of thing, but it's not obvious. And Terraform's no better. In fact, Terraform's probably a little worse on this particular case. Um, OK. Uh, template errors. Um, especially if you have uh, giant templates, you'll have errors. And um, CloudFormation will tell you when you have errors. And sometimes it will say, there's an error. It's like, excellent, excellent. Going to give me a clue? Um, and, and, and sometimes it will, and sometimes, sometimes it won't. Um, and sometimes logging out of the whole, out of your, um, your account and logging back in will make it give you the errors, and sometimes not. So what you end up having to do, um, uh, generally, is go use the CLI. This is the command you want in your toolbox. This will tell you exactly um, what's, what's wrong. Um, and generally, actually, a first step is, especially if you're writing YAML, take your whole template and toss it in YAML lint or JSON lint or whatever, because it's, it, you know, it, it's, it's just a lot quicker, especially if you're working on a nested stack that may take you know, five, 10 uh, minutes. You don't want to get to the, you know, the seventh nested stack for it to say, your YAML is off by one space. You know, find it, find it out earlier. So that's this. This is going to be your friend. Um, so special topics: um, uh, parameters, custom resources, inline lambdas, import outports, and metadata. Um, and these get pretty interesting. Um, so, um, how do you how do you deal with um, putting secrets in CloudFormation templates? Because you don't want to, of course, don't want to put them in the template. You don't want to pass them as a parameter because then you can see the parameter. So what you can do is you put your secret in a parameter store key. Then you have a parameter store resource where you specify the parameter store string. That resource in the stack gets satisfied by the value, by the key of the parameter. So your stack has access to the value, which is hopefully a secure string. Um, but it doesn't show up in the, the list of parameters. Basically, it's pretty inaccessible. So that's, that's you want to use, you want to have that trick. Um, um, yeah, you want to have that trick. OK. Um, so that's, that's a kind of cool thing to do. Um, and oh, so inline lambdas. So um, you know, we're talking about serverless. I mean, this, if I'd known we were going to be so serverless, I would have made this the first slide. But um, so you can, you can create lambdas. Um, lambdas are just a resource like anything else. You can create the resource in, in your stack. The, 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 um, the, the typical syntax for creating a lambda is to, inside CloudFormation template is to specify the URL of the S3 bucket where your lambda lives. And that's all well and good, but when you're looking at the stack, you, you're, you're looking at an S3 URL, and maybe the name tells you what the, the Lambda does. It probably should. But all you have is the name. You don't really know very much about the Lambda at all. So one of the things that they added, and you can tell by the syntax that they added it later, um, you can make the source code for the Lambda actually live in line in the CloudFormation template. Um, and so, and, and the, the clue to the syntax is you still say S3 URL, and then you put a vertical bar, and you just put the code right there. Um, so you can tell by how they're doing the parser. Um, I used to be a compiler guy. I recognize that. So for small lambdas, and shouldn't all lambdas be small? Um, uh, this keeps all the code in one place. As you're looking through the stack, you can see what the lambda is doing. The limit on the size of a lambda here is 4,000 bytes. I'm down with that. I think that's okay. Um, 
because I think the lambda should be small. Um, so do whatever you want, but this saves you not knowing what the thing does, and it saves you from having another source file, and you can do one, one um, pull request on one file that has all the information, and you can see what's going on. I think it's really worth it. Um, oh, OK, well, forgot. So, so he, yeah, here's the syntax I was talking about. Zip file, um, sub, and normally right here, you'd put the S3 URL, but here you can just put the guts of it. Um, Anyway, um, so custom resources. Um, remember when I said, um, okay, didn't click. Okay. Remember when I said uh, CloudFormation tries to keep up, but they can't always keep up. They've yep, they've given us uh, an escape hatch, which which is uh, custom resources. So if you want to create something that doesn't exist already, you can create a custom resource, custom resource, which is sort of your get out of jail uh, uh, free card. So. Um, Basically, you say, I want a, a, a custom resource, and its type is custom. <laughs> and then you give the service token, which is the lambda that you want. Um, and then um, whenever this resource gets created, this lambda gets a create event. If you update this, it gets an update event and a delete event. So you can do anything you want. Now, doing a lambda inside CloudFormation template is good for a, a couple of reasons. It, it lets you get uh, things that you couldn't normally get. So like we created, um, we were creating brokers before brokers were supported, just we had our own Lambda that would create brokers. But it also lets you do anything. We've talked about infrastructure as code and declarative, but there's times when we actually want to do a thing. Suppose you wanted to you know, put a file onto S3 or run some little operation. In this declarative, I'm going to create resources way that we're looking at things. You know, moving a file from place to place um, doesn't really fit. But you, if you write a lambda, you can have it do anything you want. Um, so, um, except they're incredibly touchy. Um, uh, so you have to call this cloud formation response uh, send with some very specific values. Um, or your template will hang. And it will hang for four hours. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can't kill it. You can't update it. Not, you are stuck. And it really is uh, f four hours. Um, so and actually, let me, let me go back. And, um, so you'll, you'll see in, the, in this example, um, so I import CloudFormation response. Um, I say the signal, you know, there's, there's this signal, it's success. I have some response data. Um, you, see that, you see that I'm putting thing, everything in tries. Sometimes, sometimes when you're writing lambdas, you say, oh, it's fine. I don't really care if things break. I, don't want, I won't do good hygiene and have tries and catches. It's, oh my god, after you have, write your first custom resources, you were going to have hygiene. <laughs> you, were gonna, you were going to declare these things. Everything is going to be inside a try and catch, and you are going to, by God, send that CloudFormation response with success or failure. Um, and if you don't do it the first time, you're going to have four hours to think about it. <laughs> um, so um, uh, find, find an example. I mean, they're really powerful, but they're, they're also horrible. Um, um, uh, outputs. So how do you pass? Um, how do you pass information uh, be, from, one st from one stack to another, um, especially if, if you have nested stacks? And, and remember, we're thinking of the nested stacks as creating our infrastructure, things like VPNs and so on. Um, and I'm, you'll notice I'm increasing the tone because I'm running out of time. Um, so you can, you can output uh, things from a nested stack either to the parent stack or to the, or to the general world. Um, and I'll show you. I think I have an example. Yeah, OK. So um, I can, in my, imagine that this is in a lower level stack and I have an output section. Ignore this for a second. If I just do this value, then the parent of this stack has access to this. Okay? And if I'm just doing a nested stack, that's fine. But if I'm creating an infrastructure where I might have a stack that creates a VPN and then all kinds of stacks are going to use it, I want to export it. And so then I do this. So this is, this is your money slide. Um, I mean, it's amazing. There's pages and pages of description, and it's really this simple. 
nested stack, any stack. Um, um, metadata, okay. Uh, you can have metadata to um, inside the stack to control um, how the stack is displayed, the order of your parameters. No one, did, nobody really does that. Um, you can do metadata though to control your cloud formation um, in its scripts. And basically, this this is how you get stuff running. Um, if you don't necessarily want to use Chef or Puppet or Ansible or one of those things, you can run when your uh, when an EC2 instance comes up, it runs cloud It runs basically this cloud formation in it. Your metadata lets you control that. Um, Okay, I'm gonna go really quick. So this is kind of a horrible slide because I had to redact so much of it. Um, <laughs> um, but um, we have user data down here, okay? And this is user data for CloudFormation script. You see that I'm, I, have a, I have a command that does a launch configuration pointing to provision compute, that provision compute instance. Um, Inside here, inside the metadata, this is the line, this is the metadata of the stack. I say the metadata, oh, cloud formation in it. I've got configuration sets, I've got the configuration compute, which matches here. And then I can do a bunch of operations, and these are sort of proprietary ones. And but then I can also have one just run start command, and I come down here, and I have some more commands. So basically, um, I'm never going to teach, teach you this in a minute. Just understand, if you know about cloud information, if you need to know about CFN and NIT, you can use metadata to control your CFN and NIT inside of your um, cloud, uh, cloud information methods. Um, okay, these real quick. Parameter uh, <coughs> echo. All the parameters you have in cloud information stacks are visible to anybody unless you say for them not to be. Um, uh, you, can, you can set it up so that you get notifications whenever anything happens with your cloud information. Uh, stack, so you can get a notification that anything came up, it started, it rolled back, it failed. Uh, you can have stack policies for what things in your confirmation stack can later be updated. And that's probably a pretty good thing to, to lock things down. There might be cases if you don't ever want to uh, uh, allow someone to update. Uh, termination protection, you can say, just like you can with EC2 instances, you can say this stack cannot be deleted from the console. And you know, there's ways around that, but at least you have to you go to delete the thing and it says, you just tried to delete you know, the production database. Don't do that, that's really, 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 really sure. And you've updated your resume. Um, <laughs> uh, continue update rollback. Sometimes when there's a failure and it tries to roll back, it gets another failure and it gets stuck. And, oh well. Um, and basically, uh, this is the, I've made some modifications, I've, man I've probably manually deleted some things the cloud information wasn't able to delete. Please continue and clean up the rest of it. So, um, I hope you never run into this, but you will. Updating templates, oh my, okay. Updating templates, templates live in S3. You can update the template by editing it or pointing to a, to a new one. Um, you can also update its uh, resources by changing uh, its, its parameters. Um, so that gets to, and this is probably really important, I'll stick on this for just this one or two minutes I have left. Um, so I want to I wanna update the resource. Each resource is different. Some resources can be updated in place. Some cannot. The resources that cannot be updated in place will get replaced. If you have things that depend on that resource and depend on that resource being up, and it gets replaced, that can mean downtime. So you want to really pay attention to that. Um, and each, re each resource described can be updated. Um, so like here, um, in, in, uh, this is the documentation of broker. Uh, broker name. Yeah, if you change the name of the broker, the broker tears down, that's six minutes, and then the new one spins up, that's about 12 minutes, and that's all downtime. Okay, do that, and that's your cognizant. Um, uh, if you change the set of users, it says some interruptions. It requires a reboot. And then there are other ones that say um, basically just um, just updates. Okay, so when you're going to um, update resources, you really want to go to the page for that resource and see what's involved. Because having an unexpected uh, 18 minutes of downtime <coughs> really ruin your day. Uh, nested updates. Okay, if you update. So 
you can, you can, and I, I am certain of that, so I'm going to leave, it actually works out, I'm going to leave you with the question, I'm not going to answer this question. <laughs> um, uh, if you update a top level set, it will also go down and try to update the nested sets. Mm -hmm. Okay. If the main stack has no changes, but the nested stack does, and you say I want to update the top level <coughs> stack, what happens? Her answer is it depends. <laughs> so, so I'll tie it right back before they come. Now, um, if, the, if the updated, if the nested stack changed just by a version, and you have versions built in to, into the source code of the nested stack that you substitute in Gradle, the top level stack may not notice that there's been any change. But if you've used versions and you said the version in your parameter list your top level stack, you said one of my parameters is the version of my lower level stack and you change the version of the top level stack and the permission knows that there's a version and updates the lower level stack. And I'm out of time. Oh my god, the last slide. Uh, this is, um, I probably shouldn't put in this in there, but this is uh, some of the, uh, the folks at Hashi for a while they said for a time. And so we'll, we'll just, we'll go back with you. There we go, and we're done. within uh, your uh, the stacks? That's a great question. Um, as much as I've, I've, I've ragged on, on, on CloudFormation, CloudFormation in general does a very, very good job at automatically determining uh, re resource order. So uh, um, earlier I showed, um, you know, anytime you have a ref to another resource, CloudFormation knows, well, I can't ref to the other thing until I've created the other thing. So it generally does a, a, a pretty credible job of figuring out dependencies. You can put explicit dependency um, notifications. Say, I depend on this, and that's actually not a terrible. Act. It's not a terrible thing to tell confirmation, but also to tell your reader, to tell your human, I depend on this. So I'd use a combination of both. Is there any way to do a regex? Uh, regex on allowed values, so like only allow a string that has that starts with this. Of a certain number of characters, <coughs> a certain substring. Uh, 
Yes. I'm trying to be better. Yes. yes. We did it in this case, but yes, it, it's, it's, uh, could it be more powerful? Sure, but yeah. So I write my templates in JSON and my buddy does YAML. Is there an easy way to convert the two so that we can both do our own thing? <laughs> that designer tool yeah. lets you switch right between the two. It does? Yeah. yeah. Sweet. Radio loves. Perfect. <laughs> One of you must die. <laughs>